Good morning. My name is Clint Williamson. I'm a professor of practice at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and also serve as senior director for rule of law, governance, and security at the university's McCain Institute here in Washington. I want to welcome you and at this point introduce our host for today's event, the president and chief executive officer of New America, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, uh, and welcome to the next president's fight against terror. I can't really imagine a more topical conversation. Indeed, I was reading the Times this morning and reading about uh, the uh, the fight in Mosul, and and th you know this is this is in the forefront of our minds internationally, but also increasingly uh, nationally as well. Uh, and I'm also thrilled to be doing this with ASU, uh, with a ASU in Arizona and ASU in Washington, uh, with the McCain Institute for International Leadership. Uh, I want to say a word just about our partnership. We think it's really unique to have a think tank and a major university partnering in generating knowledge and then applying that knowledge, turning things like uh, our Future of War project into instructional materials, uh, and then using those for students, uh, possibly for uh, online courses, uh, but also, of course, working to apply that knowledge in Washington, which is what the McCain Institute uh, and New America do directly. So I'm thrilled to be doing this. Uh, I want to thank a few people, and then I'll just give you three points, because anybody from New America who knows me knows I can't actually say anything unless I give you three points about something. Uh, but I, I want to thank, you're, I mean, you're going you're gonna to hear all day from many of the people um, who put this together, Peter Bergen, our New America's head of International Security Project and the Fellows Program, uh, Peter Bergen, who also has this gig at CNN, but really it's about New America. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, you just heard from Clint Williamson. Uh, you'll hear next from Ambassador Kurt Volker, the head of the McCain Institute. Uh, and many of my old friends, uh, Jack Goldsmith, a former colleague from Harvard Law School, Andrew Basevich, uh, Hina Shamsi, Benjamin Wittes, my Twitter fight club buddy, uh, and Mary DeRosa, uh, Icon Erdemir, Nancy Okal, uh, Raza Rumi, Samuel, Samuel Moyne, uh, and Doug, Doug Sylvester, also uh, uh, the dean of the uh, ASU Law School, uh, which a wonderful group of people who work together on rule of law and counterterrorism uh, to bring those issues together in the way we must do uh, for this fight. So then I want to give you three points that I hope you'll think about during the day. The first is two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, and Jack Goldsmith is there to my right, and he fought the good fight uh, during the George W. Bush administration to make sure that the way we fought terrorism preserved our values uh, and did not, uh, in fact, vindicate their values. So two wrongs, as the mother in me says, don't make a right. Uh, and the second is we need to get past counter. Right? Everything is counter-terrorism, counter-violent extremism, counter-narratives. We're not going to win this without a positive narrative and vision. And people like New America's Nadia Oweidat are arguing, you know, you can't, you can push back on their interpretation of Islam, but you need a vision of a secular uh, Arab society in which everyone is free to worship and in which many of the glories of Arab civilization or Muslim civilization, much, much uh, writ large, are, are forefront. So it can't just be counter. And the third is we need new tools. And we need, we need to analyze this problem, I think, more deeply than just counterterrorism or counterviolent extremism. What's causing the allure of extremism or terrorism in the first place? Why are so many young people drawn to this vision? There are many explanations. The one I favor is Sarah Shays' account of how corruption often triggers an extreme counter-reaction, as it has actually done with the Puritans uh, in, in the uh, uh, origins of this country and in many others. But whatever it is, we've got to get there, and we've got to have tools that fight this problem at its roots, and that is not military action. So with that, let me turn it over to Ambassador Kurt Volker and welcome you all to a fabulous day. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you uh, to New America uh, for putting this event together and hosting it with us. And uh, let me echo Anne-Marie's comments about the great partnership that has grown up between Arizona State University, um, and in particular the law school, the um, New America Foundation, and the McCain Institute. Uh, we've done tremendous things together. We've shared a lot of things together. Uh, one of the things we do at the McCain Institute is organize public debates about key foreign policy challenges. Peter Bergen took place in our most recent one in September about whether ISIS is winning or not. Anne Marie actually took place in the very first one we did back in 2013 on the question of whether we should intervene in Syria or not. I won't tell you what side she argued. Uh, <laughs> I also want to say a word about the Global Rule of Law and Governance Program that we've launched uh, with the McCain Institute and uh, with the ASU uh, Law School, and, and the Dean of the Law School uh, is here um, with us today. And uh, what I would like to say about that is it is truly a unique program for law students and a unique program for creating an operational capability to engage in global rule of law and governance projects around the world. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador Clint Williamson, who, will you, who is here with us on stage, uh, who leads that program, and the idea is to create a specialization within teaching law for law students so they get a window into global rule of law and governance issues. Imagine that you're talking about lawyers working with assistance missions overseas, UN missions overseas, AID missions, international peacekeeping forces. There is a demand for lawyers with skills in that area, and this program is teaching uh, those skills, really a unique one in the country. And with that, we have Clint, who is physically located here in the New America Foundation, part of the McCain Institute, part of the ASU Sandra Day O'Connor School, uh, who leads that effort and who has created an operational capability to do things like train uh, Pakistani prosecutors, train prosecutors from Sierra Leone, engage law students from Pakistan. And this is, a, this is going to be a growth industry um, in the world, and the McCain Institute is really delighted to be at the forefront of that. Uh, on the substance of this, like Anne-Marie, I can't resist saying a couple words about the substance because I was also involved in this at the end of the uh, George W. Bush administration. Uh, I was um, the principal deputy assistant secretary for European affairs. Uh, John Bellinger, a good friend of mine, was the legal advisor at the State Department. And following uh, 2005, six, after some key decisions by the Bush administration to reframe and, and change some of its approaches in the uh, war against terrorism, including, for instance, closing the black sites that had existed, uh, we took it upon ourselves to work with European allies on the legal framework. Uh, we created a so-called West Point group that John led uh, that was getting legal advisors talking through these issues. And let me just say this. Terrorists, by definition, don't play by the rules. As a result, the rules that we created decades ago to govern the way we conduct warfare uh, is something that they ignore and something that doesn't give us, as Anne-Marie said, doesn't give us the tools that we need to fight terrorism effectively. And the dirty secret in Washington is that the Obama administration has basically played by the same legal framework that the George W. Bush administration created uh, for dealing with the war on terrorism. And the reason is we can't come up with anything better on our own. Uh, we need to have a broader international framework that gets around the issue of it's not a conventional war, it's also not a police uh, uh, domestic uh, action that we have to deal with. We have something that is different from everything we planned on, and we've got to create the new tools to do it. That's going to be the challenge facing a, a new administration, whoever it may be, and they're going to be faced with the uh, immediate, immediate terrorist challenges from ISIS, uh, from other groups. It's going to be on a global basis. They will be seeking to attack us, seeking to attack our allies, particularly France. We've seen what happened in Belgium. So it is urgent that we get our arms around the right way to tackle this problem for the long term. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here as part of this event. And I will turn it over uh, to Professor Goldsmith. Thank you. Hi, and welcome. I'm Jack Goldsmith. I teach at Harvard Law School, and I'm also honored to be the Barry Goldwater 
chair of American institutions at uh, ASU. And I'm also honored to help um, to have helped organize this conference today. I'm going to introduce Professor Basevich, but I was asked first to, to frame the day a bit. And I'm, since I'm a lawyer, I'm going to do so in broad-based constitutional terms. So we're in the 16th year of an armed conflict that began uh, in September of 2001. It's the longest armed conflict in American history. It has uh, taken up almost um, the entire two terms of two presidents now. So we're on the verge of having the third 9-11 presidency. In those over 15 years, of course, things have changed a lot. The nature of the enemy has changed a lot. The identity of the enemy has changed. The geographical scope of the conflict, as lawyers think of it, has changed quite a lot. And our tactics have changed quite a lot. To, make, to, to be much too simplistic, we've gone from, and this is, I, I think, that the way that the Obama administration has talked about it, from a heavy footprint approach to a light footprint approach, by which I mean that we're conducting this armed conflict today primarily at a distance using air, air, air fire, often from drones. Uh, special operations forces play a large part of it. They're not always at a distance, but they are stealthy. Uh, we know very little about what our special operations forces are doing around the world. We're also deploying cyber. We know very little about how those offensive weapons are being used. So this is a war that Americans really don't see in the way that they would normally see war. And I'm talking about the legal conflict. And uh, it's also one where Congress has barely been engaged. Congress authorized the president on September, in September of 2001 to conduct, uh, to use military force against al-Qaeda and, and the other entities responsible for 9-11. And that authorization still remains today the primary foundation for a global conflict. And just to give you a, we, and when I say a global conflict, the remarkable thing is American citizens who read the newspapers don't know the scale of it. It's, it's really hard to know what the scale of our conflict is. The President, President Obama has used military force, air force, air fire in seven countries during his presidency, at least seven countries. If you read the War Powers Resolution reports that presidents occasionally send to Congress, which I do, you could count and see that we have deployed armed forces in 15 or 16 countries. We have very general descriptions of what they're doing in those countries. In some countries, we have a better sense than others. But then there's been a new, in, new development that started in the Bush administration and has continued in the Obama administration of a classified annex to the War Powers Resolution. So with that, there's stuff in that classified annex that we don't know, so we really don't know. The scope of the war is probably broader than that. Special Operations Forces, we're told, are present in 80 countries. A lot of that is training, but we have offensive military force being deployed around the globe, and we don't really, even as American citizens, under, understand the nature of it. And um, I think that this form of warfare, I'm not saying it's, in, it, what's its, it's, in, it's its intent, but it's by design the type of warfare that stays out of public debate because American soldiers are rarely being killed and a lot of it's taking place in secret. So the public debate compared to the Bush administration has receded, I think. Congressional attention has been intermittent at best. The courts were engaged during the Bush administration primarily because of Gitmo. They're not engaged uh, in, in scrutinizing this war anymore. So it's basically being run by the president, the president of the United States. And President Obama has been a surprisingly aggressive president in expanding legal precedents to conduct war, both in interpreting the authorization from September 11 and in using his own military powers to use force. So basically, we're in a situation where we appear to be an endless secret war with very little domestic scrutiny, and I put it to you that that's not a good situation for a constitutional democracy to be in, which leads to the next presidency. Um, so it's going to be one of two people who are going to be the next president. If it's Donald Trump, that, that, that comes with, if he's commander-in-chief, that presents uh, obvious difficulties, which I won't go into. I think they're apparent. But the much more likely president is Hillary Clinton, and Hillary Clinton has basically made clear both from her past actions and what she said on the campaign trail I think she's likely to be a more hawkish president than President Obama. So we're facing a situation where the probable next president is going to be more hawkish, and she has these tools and these precedents for really quite expansive, largely secret warfare. So I want to suggest that that's where we are uh, several weeks before the election. 
Um, okay, now I want to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Andrew Basevich. He uh, is going to speak about President Obama's national security legacy. Um, professor Basevich is a professor of history and international relations at Boston University. He served in the, in the Army for 23 years. He went to the U.S. Military Academy. He is my favorite, uh, one of my favorites, I should say, uh, critic of American legal and foreign policy. I read his books as soon as they come out. His most recent book is War for the Greater Middle East. He's an incisive and learned critic of U.S. Uh, national security and military affairs, and he's going to talk to us now about President Obama's legacy. Thank you. Well, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to uh, speak here. Thanks for the uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, my task is to uh, talk for 30 minutes so that we have something like 15 minutes uh, for a discussion before I vacate the stage. My problem is I have a 45-minute talk uh, on uh, the President's uh, foreign policy legacy, so I'm hereby going to chop off the first third. Uh, and what the first third of the talk uh, discusses uh, is uh, what we used to call the global war on terrorism, and, and, the, and, and it renders a, a judgment, and the, the judgment that it renders is that President Obama has been a disappointment as Commander-in-Chief. He ran for the presidency uh, telling us that he was going to bring the Iraq war to a responsible end and that he was going to win the Afghanistan war. He's accomplished neither of those tasks. He will instead bequeath to his successor those two wars which which together, or individually, separately, are the longest wars uh, in, our, in our history. More broadly, uh, I think his distinctive approach to conducting war, what uh, Professor uh, Goldsmith referred to as the light footprint approach, has had the paradoxical effect of desensitizing the American public to war's perpetuation by reducing U.S. casualties and moderating financial costs, as, <clears throat> as President Obama has done, those factors drain war of its domestic political significance. So that U.S. forces are today more or less permanently, permanently engaged in active combat on the far side of the planet has become one of those things that Americans today simply accept, like persistent budget deficits or periodic mass shootings. After 9-11, George W. Bush told Americans to chill out and go shopping under Barack Obama, they have done just that. And however, at odds with the hopes and expectations that carried President Obama into office, this forms an important part of his legacy. Uh, you know, I was yesterday for a project, I was sitting in the Syracuse airport, <clears throat> bored out of my mind, uh, and I had the occasion to reread uh, President Kennedy's famous American University address, and odd conjunction perhaps, also reread uh, <coughs> President Reagan's Star Wars uh, speech of what, roughly 25 years later. And what is so striking is the reminder that in those days, presidents talked about peace, a word they repeatedly used as the intended end of U.S. foreign policy. We don't talk about peace anymore, uh, even in a presidential election year. The fact is, I think, uh, that Obama's performance as commander-in-chief has been less than stellar. A mess when he took office, the greater Middle East will be no less a mess when he steps down. And indeed, and again, as far as peace is concerned, we just don't talk about it. So if you stop there, it seems to me President Obama has much to answer for. True, we may be grateful that during his presidency, the United States has not suffered catastrophes comparable to those that marred the term of his predecessor, who was blindsided by 9-11 and then plunged fatefully, recklessly into Iraq, but that's a pretty low bar of success, I would offer, uh, suggest. In the long run, however, Obama's fumbling performance as a war manager is unlikely, in my view, to determine his overall reputation as a statesman. With time, as circumstances evolve, unpleasant memories fade and judgments soften. Today, for example, even an ostensibly liberal Democrat like Hillary Clinton regards Henry Kissinger as a brilliant strategist. His role in orchestrating the opening with China, eclipsing the brutal and purposeless escalation of the Vietnam War, 
that he helped contrive while serving as Richard Nixon's chief lieutenant. In the scales of history, I would say, sadly, in the scales of history, the Americans killed in Vietnam while Kissinger was national security advisor and secretary of state count for less than the cornucopia of Asian trade and investment that he helped make possible. And I think President Obama may benefit from a similar phenomenon. His, his marks as diplomat in chief, eventually compensating for his indifferent record as commander in chief. The departing president will leave behind several noteworthy initiatives, mostly unrelated to our current wars, that may, emphasize may, in time bear fruit and thereby elevate his standing in history. Granted, the fruits could also turn out to be poisonous ones. And in that sense, Obama's reputation is likely to depend in no small measure on what his successors do with the things that he inaugurated, but the remain works in progress. So under the heading of Obama's unfinished business, uh, let me uh, talk briefly about eight distinct issues listed here in ascending order of importance. First, Cuba. Now, cleaning up past mistakes and liquidating policies that have outlived their utility number among the less glamorous aspects of statecraft. It's not the sort of work that wins you plaudits, but like the proverbial guy with the broom marching behind the elephants in the circus parade, somebody's got to do it. President Jimmy Carter was that someone when he negotiated the Panama Canal Treaty, thereby relieving the United States of a vestige of colonialism destined to become a source of ever greater controversy, a necessary action which Carter, for which Carter received mostly brickbats uh, from Americans angry that he was re relinquishing our canal. So too with Obama. In bringing to a close the, the long U.S. estrangement from Cuba, the president did something that ought to have been done long ago. Whatever the putative danger of fidelismo, back when the Cuban revolution was in its ascendancy, that danger has long since dissipated. Employing economic sanctions with expectations of overthrowing the Castro regime received more than a fair trial without evidence of succeeding. After more than a half century, the time for trying a different tack had clearly arrived, uh, even if President Obama will receive no more credit than President Carter did for the canal, and even if, sadly, Cubans opt to forfeit their hard-won sovereignty by converting their country into a Caribbean Las Vegas. Similarly, in laboring to close down the US military prison in Guantanamo, the president has sought to reverse the most egregious unforced error of the post 9-11 era. As everyone, I think, apart from a handful of right-wing ideologues has long since recognized, Guantanamo is a huge embarrassment its existence exacerbating the very problem it purports to uh, alleviate. And closing it, uh, if it ever closes, will then signal that the hysteria that gripped Washington in the immediate aftermath of September uh, 2001 has finally passed. Granted, Republicans more interested in scoring partisan points than in actually fighting terrorism uh, have opposed Obama every step of the way, and they continue to do so, but he, not they, is likely to receive history's ultimate vindication. Second item, trade. Popular support for free trade in this country is eroding, best I can tell. Previous deals, uh, such as Bill Clinton's North American Free Trade Agreement, have cost more American jobs than they created. Globalization turns out not to be a win-win proposition after all. So at least, it appears to Americans struggling to make a living in surviving pockets of the post-war industrial economy. By throwing support behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership, Obama is therefore bucking strong headwinds. The president touts TPP as, quote, leveling the playing field for American workers and business so we can export more products stamped made in America all over the world that support higher paying American jobs here at home. Of course, that's what free trade proponents always say. Now, there is no doubt that international trade fuels overall economic expansion. But today, the operative question is becoming this one. Who benefits? And assuming 
that Congress approves the TPP, I think years are going to pass before a definitive answer to that question emerges, and only then will it be possible to render an authoritative judgment on Obama's stewardship of the American economy. Third, Russia. While visiting Moscow in 2009, President Obama called for a reset in U.S.-Russian relations, adding that, quote, the days when empires could treat other sovereign states as pieces on a chessboard are over. Well, the proposed reset went nowhere. And in the years since, the geopolitical chessboard, or the geopolitical chess game, uh, resumed with a vengeance. Regardless of what Obama may have thought, when vital interests are at stake, sovereign states make their own rules. In Crimea, Ukraine, in Syria, Vladimir Putin has acted without hesitation to secure interests he deems vital. Now, some observers see in Russian muscle flexing evidence of a new Cold War taking shape, and they urge the United States to dust off its 1940s playbook in this city, where I think residual uh, Russophobia flourishes. Get tough on Moscow is a cheap but reliable applause line. Obama has taken a different tack. Today's Russia is, in his words, merely a regional power. It acts, he says, not out of strength, but out of weakness. Or, I think he might have added, Russia acts in response to grievances, genuine grievances, made more acute by the post-Cold War expansion of NATO and the European Union up to Russia's own borders. Well, I think in dealing with the Kremlin, Obama has learned to play chess. This has not occurred without missteps, his administration's foolish promotion of regime change in Kiev, plunging Ukraine into permanent crisis, offering one example of those missteps. Yet overall, Obama has acted with circumspection. Lines of communication to Moscow have remained open. Where U.S. and Russian interests align, for example, regarding, the, uh, uh, regarding Iran's uh, nuclear program, collaboration occurs. Now, to reassure nervous allies on NATO's exposed eastern flank, Obama has offered reinforcements, but the reinforcements have been quite modest. A brigade headquarters in Poland, a small contingent, uh, Air Force contingent to, uh, 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 to p p police uh, Baltic airspace. That is to say, he has not panicked and he has not overreacted. Without courting confrontation, he has sought to signal that the United States still considers its NATO treaty uh, obligations sac uh, sacrosanct, yet he is also, properly I think, pressed free-riding Europeans to do more to defend themselves. In effect, Obama classifies Russia as an annoyance, impossible to ignore, but not worth the bother of taking too seriously. At a time when there are far more important issues at play, in play, annoyance does not justify a major reorientation of U.S. policy priorities. So for Obama, Russia is a second-tier problem. Whether this assessment will, will stand the test of time remains to be seen. My guess is that it will. Fourth, China. At the very top of the first tier sits Asia, and especially China as competitor and partner. In 21st century geopolitics, it seems to me no question surpasses this one in importance. How does China define its ambitions? And experts uh, uh, endlessly opine on that question, but I think the truth is no one knows. Indeed, my guess is that the Chinese leadership itself may not have arrived at a common view regarding China's intended future, expected future as a global power. Well, Obama's response to this uncertainty has emphasized hedging marketed as a so-called pivot toward Asia, a deliberate reorientation of assets in attention to a region arguably meriting more of both. Critics complain of a very long and very elaborate wind-up that has thus far produced a rather slow and not very impressive pitch. And indeed, if the aim, if, if the aim is to restrain China, then results achieved thus far qualify as disappointing. China does continue to expand its military capabilities and to engage in actions that the United States deems provocative. For example, staking out territorial claims in the South China Sea. I would note parenthetically 
in, in, uh, in Washington's eyes, U.S. military activities in the region, which occur on a vastly larger scale, are by definition the inverse of provocative. Yet Obama's pivot is spurring a realignment of power relationships throughout East Asia. China's neighbors, such as Vietnam, of all people, the Vietnamese uh, see in Chinese behavior reason to cozy up to America. It's geopolitics 101, albeit complicated in this case by the fact that the rising power that some in Washington wish to contain also happens to be America's leading foreign creditor. Fifth, Iran. The Iran nuclear deal, formerly known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, represents, in my judgment, far and away, Obama's boldest diplomatic gambit. In conjunction with other leading powers, notably including Russia and China, and despite fierce opposition led by the Israel lobby, the Obama administration forged an agreement that suspends Iran's nuclear weapons development program for at least the next decade in return for offering that nation an opportunity to reintegrate itself into the international community. community. Well, I think that ensuring that Iran does not join the nuclear club is an unambiguous good. Ending Iranian isolation, however, entails large risks, and the jury is still out on whether Iran, whether Iran will choose to play a responsible role or whether it will live up to its reputation as a leading state sponsor of terrorism. If the gamble pays off, the gamble that Iran will choose to behave as a responsible player if the gamble pays off, historians may one day cite the JCPOA as the first step toward restoring stability in the Middle East. And in that case, the Nobel Committee may wish to publish an addendum to the citation it prematurely awarded Obama back in 2009. The addendum will say something like, see, we told you he deserved the Peace Prize. That said, if the gamble fails, and it may, then the committee might consider simply revoking the award altogether. Sixth, nuclear weapons. During his uh, visit to Hiroshima uh, earlier this year, President Obama uh, affirmed his earnest desire to one day see, quote, a world without nuclear weapons. And the president thereby echoed hopes voiced by his predecessors going back to Harry Truman, and indeed, who knows, some of those presidents may actually have meant what they said. Meanwhile, however, a different Barack Obama, impersonator, evil twin, a different Barack Obama was directing the president to modernize the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal. When completed decades from now, more or less on the 100th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, when completed decades from now, uh, the Obama program will have cost the American taxpayer as much as a trillion dollars. The nation's nuclear strike force will have acquired by then better, smaller, and more flexible nuclear warheads, along with new bombers, new missiles, and new submarines to launch the missiles. By then, no doubt, several more American presidents will have expressed their earnest hope of seeing a nuclear weapons-free world. In short, pious rhetoric notwithstanding, Obama has affirmed the position to which his predecessors since, since 1945, with the arguable exception of Ronald Reagan, have all subscribed, namely, that nuclear disarmament poses an unacceptable risk to U.S. national security. Or, to put it another way, only the possession of a doomsday arsenal held in instant readiness to blow up the world can guarantee this nation's safety and survival. Now, one can make the case that this approach has worked well enough thus far. After all, since the dawn of the nuclear era, the nation has evaded extinction, and America has successfully, uh, if on occasion narrowly, avoided being attacked by weapons that we created. Obama is betting that a further investment in nukes will keep that record intact. Should that turn out to be a miscalculation, then the criticism heaped on his head today for allowing the Benghazi consulate to be overrun uh, will, uh, will pale in comparison. Seventh item, cybersecurity. 
Operation Olympic Games, the 2010 uh, uh, Israeli-American cyber attack on an Iranian nuclear facility, was the Pearl Harbor of the information age. Like Pearl Harbor, it inaugurated a new form of warfare, but settled nothing. Americans once believed that preserving their way of life depended on ensuring access to Persian Gulf oil, an illusion uh, resulting in a decades-long series of armed conflicts uh, from which the United States has yet to escape. Meanwhile, however, ensuring the integrity of networks, business, commercial, military, and otherwise, has actually become far more critical to American well-being than foreign oil ever was. And you have to wonder if authorities in the city have ever so radically misconstrued the national interest. President Obama seems to grasp the significance of this misplaced emphasis. During the first year of his presidency, U.S. Cyber Command became fully operational. Attracting less attention than the ongoing operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, it may actually outrank those wars in importance. This latest addition to the Pentagon's stable of major commands is charged with conducting, quote, full spectrum military cyberspace operations. Although much of what the command does is classified, we know that those operations are both defensive and offensive in nature. Americans today, me included, take it on faith that Cyber Command has its act together, and perhaps it does. So far, at least, despite a rash of hackings by antagonists abroad, the nation's cyber defenses appear to be holding. And we'll know immediately when they don't, because the lights will go out, and we'll discover what it's like to live in the 1940s. And should that occur, Obama and others will have much to answer for. Eighth and last item, climate change. Remember, this is a sending order of importance. Cuba least important, in my judgment, climate change most important. The rapidly warming planet is not an American problem, it's a global problem, which has thus far elicited more lip service than action. Still, President Obama provided much of the impetus behind efforts that culminated in the Paris climate deal signed last year by 196, 196 nations. Among the signatories, importantly, are the mega polluters like India, China, and of course the United States of America. Obama described the compact as, quote, the best chance we have to save the one planet we've got. And it may well be. Yet, the progress it represents is tentative and partial. Knowing that the deal would never pass muster with the Republican-controlled Senate, President Obama resorted to the dubious ploy of characterizing it as an executive agreement rather than as a treaty, thereby empowering future presidents to opt out should they find it expedient to do so. Notably, Donald Trump has dismissed climate change as a hoax, while the 2016 Republican Party platform explicitly rejects the Paris Agreement. Beyond that, even if the United States and other signatories remain, uh, uh, remain party to the agreement, the Paris deal by no means solves the problem. Actual implementation uh, poses vast challenges. In the most optimistic scenario, full compliance will not end global warming. It will merely slow it. Real hope is that the Paris deal will contribute to forging a global consensus that will, that will provide a basis for further action. Now, put the best face on all of these uh, uh, initiatives, that are, all this unfinished business, and you're still left feeling uh, that, that Obama's legacy remains vaguely unsatisfactory. Certainly, his record falls well short of what his legions of supporters were counting on back in 2008 when they voted for hope and change. When it comes to foreign policy, it seems to me, it's the absence of definitive, definitive outcomes that leads many to see Obama as a disappointment. The end of the Cold War had bred in Americans certain convictions about the way the global order was, was, was hen henceforth supposed to function. In an era that we claimed was to be dominated by a single superpower, us, Washington was going to call the tune. Supposedly, adversaries were going to think twice about challenging the indispensable nation. 
and they would face the wrath of the world's most powerful military if they made the mistake of doing so. Allies would tip their caps in gratitude and perhaps even pay tribute. And American values, above all the ever-changing American conception of freedom, would prevail everywhere. Now, although the, the events of 9-11 might have disabused Americans of such notions, George W. Bush took it upon himself to reaffirm those expectations. Taking down the axis of evil, he believed, would demonstrate that the United States remains the engine of history, that those post-Cold War ex expectations remained valid. Indeed, at the first glimmerings of success, Bush went so far as to quite literally host a banner proclaiming mission accomplished. This declaration of victory, however, turned out to be mortifyingly premature. The banner, wherever it is, uh, in some closet, uh, it would probably remain there for some time to come. Certainly, President uh, Obama has shown no inclination to pull it out. To attend to what President Obama has to say in the twilight of his presidency is to encounter someone who I believe is now persuaded that the mission, as Washington defined it, back when history itself had ostensibly ended, that the mission is a fool's, er a fool's errand which should be abandoned. Few others in this city, as far as I can tell, are even willing to countenance such a prospect to consider the possibility that maybe we're not the indispensable nation. And in this regard, as in others, President Obama finds himself something of a lonely figure. The era that began with the passing of the Cold War had essentially ended by the time Obama came into office. At the time, neither he nor others understood this, of course, and, he, but, and even so, over the course of two terms, Obama quietly fashioned himself into the first president of the as-yet-to-be-named era in which we now find ourselves. One of this era's abiding characteristics is that authority and responsibilities are being dispersed. The emerging order is both multipolar and radically de decentralized. As a consequence, decisions made in Washington no longer determine the way the world works, if indeed they ever did. I think President Obama actually gets this. In the remarkable series of interviews that formed the basis of Jeffrey Goldberg's uh, mistitled essay, The Obama Doctrine, the president offers a nuanced appreciation for the complexity defining this post-post-Cold War era. In his conversations with Goldberg, the president suggests that doctrine itself is part of the problem. Washington's fixation with doctrine inhibits its ability to address complexity. Obama goes out of his way in, in his discussions with Goldberg to express his disdain for the foreign policy establishment's hidebound playbook, as Obama called it. Granted, 30 years ago, certainly 60 years ago, the playbook retained some value. But today, I think, I think Obama believes the perpetuation of the play, playbook offers evidence of advanced intellectual sclerosis. Obama's fate, however, at least for now, is to be judged according to criteria that derive from the obsolete playbook. Years from now, I expect, historians will judge him by a somewhat different standard. And they may see his chief failing, uh, the, the fact that while recognizing that the, that the uh, playbook had become outmoded. He, he was unable to persuade others in the political class to recognize and embrace some alternative to that playbook. Throughout his life, Obama has demonstrated a striking aptitude for mastering whatever environment in which he happens to find himself. He learns, he adapts, he's a quick study. After two terms of on-the-job training, he has acquired a remarkable grasp for the intricacies of 21st century statecraft. Now that he is constitutionally ineligible for election to the presidency, he has everything required to fill that office with great distinction. Now that's irony for you. Thank you very much. Pardon me? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So I love your, your age, and I was trying to remember them as you went through them. But it is very striking, given today's subject, that 
so I just said I love your eight things. Um, but it's, ex it's really striking. You never mention the war on terror. That's not one of your, or however we're going to call That's it. That's the first five pages of the talk that I skipped over. I'd be glad to give them to you if you well, wanted to. Uh, well, I, I guess. any time for discussion. I guess the question is, where does it fit I those eight challenges, which I think are masterful and lay out uh, exactly what the next president has to face and what he has to do. But w where would you put Afghan Al Qaeda, countering, I mean, uh, ISIL, sort of that threat, whatever the name is, in those eight, uh, in, in your, your hierarchy? Well, first thing, I, I think I would distinguish between uh, ISIS, ISIL, and uh, the larger problem of whatever the politically correct term is these days of uh, violent uh, jihadism. Uh, my own view would be that the threat uh, to the United States uh, posed by uh, ISIS is uh, relatively insignificant. Uh, there is a tendency in some quarters to act as if ISIS poses an existential threat to the United States. It just flat out doesn't. I don't know what the current order of battle is. The current order of battle is being reduced on a daily basis, but uh, Peter knows probably better than I do. ISIS probably has, what, 20, 25,000 fighters, if that? Uh, 15 to 25,000 fighters. They've got no air force. They've got no navy. They've got no weapons of mass destruction. They have very little heavy equipment. They've got a, a shrinking resource base. Uh, they have no significant allies. You know, we're not talking about the Wehrmacht here. Uh, ISIS does pose a threat to uh, the powers in the region. Poses an existential threat to Iraq. Could pose an existential threat to Iran, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it seems to me that in that regard, with regard specifically to what to do about ISIS, uh, our, our task uh, is a diplomatic one of, of getting parties in the region to recognize the extent of the threat that they face and persuading them, this is, this is difficult, this is not easy, persuading them to set aside their differences with one another, at least temporarily, so as to make common cause with the immediate threat. They could solve their problem. Again, I mean, it's not the Wehrmacht. Were Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey uh, uh, and uh, whatever Iraq is uh, to, to uh, cooperate with one another in this regard, it seems to me that the problem would be solved, the problem of ISIS would be solved uh, rather expeditiously. I think. Uh, now, that, now that, that argument reflects my larger view, it's the argument made in my book, America's War for the Greater Middle East, uh, that our military efforts in this region, and, and my narrative doesn't begin 9-11, uh, my narrative begins in 1980, that's, that's the date when we begin militarizing our approach to the Persian Gulf and, and its surrounding uh, area. Uh, my reading of the record of U.S. military intervention since 1980 is that this is a fool's errand. This is a counterproductive exercise. We're not, we're not, we're not making things better. We're making things worse. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me, A, it's, it's past time for us to acknowledge the failure of U.S. military policy in the region. Only if we acknowledge that does it become possible to have a serious discussion about what alternatives may be. I mean, you, you touched on, on, on that a little bit in your, in your, in, in your three points, but it, it, it does seem to me that to the extent that we can, uh, on the margins, uh, on the margins, uh, have some effect on uh, the direction of events in the region, it is not going to be through U.S. military action. You can go until 10.15. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, you're getting the mic. Uh, Warren Coates, retired from the International Monetary Fund. Your discussion of the TPP didn't touch on the global political dimension or its implications for American leadership in, in that system. Could you address that? I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. 
mean, so, so, so yes, the United States uh, since World War II has been a leader in trying to create an open uh, international uh, or, or a global economy. Uh, the TPP, I, I guess one would argue, uh, reflects a continuation of that decades-long uh, effort. Uh, more than it, it that, does. many of us see the TPP's importance more in the pivot to Asia and our leadership role in that area than we do the economic aspects. Now, I have to say, you know, I, I, I have not thought a lot about it in that context, and perhaps I'm too much a prisoner of what seems to be our political debate in this season which tends to focus on the uh, domestic implications of uh, continuing to pursue this, uh, this vision of, a, of an open uh, international order. So I, I, don't have a, I don't have an answer for you. I gotta think about that. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you're gonna make me think about it. There's somebody in the, next to the aisle halfway back. Thank you, good morning. Hello. Uh, my name is Mohammed Saman. I'm the I'm senior in America. I'm the founder of Syria Advice Center based here in Washington, D.C. We know a lot about ISIS down there in Syria and Iraq. I agree with you that their capabilities on the military side, on the ground, on the battlefield is diminishing significantly. But when you go global, it's quite scary. Yep. Those people, those criminals are way sophisticated and smart, you know. And what worries me really is that we are not responding to that threat creatively. We need to be more proactive on that. And I believe the next administration, and that's the theme for this discussion today, really need to think about it in that context. They really need to be creative and proactive dealing with this horrendous threat. I'm in favor of creativity. Thank you. Uh, I have to say that uh, my expectation is that you will be disappointed, uh, regardless of who wins the election. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump is going to win. Uh, should he do so, all bets are off. Uh, uh, I expect that Hillary Clinton will win, uh, and uh, my own judgment would be is that uh, she, she shows remarkably little by way of creativity. Uh, she believes in the playbook that President Obama disparages, and I agree that uh, her, her commitment to that playbook makes her, in all likelihood, uh, uh, she'll be a far more hawkish uh, president than Obama. You know, my, uh, t to me, the most significant episode of her tenure as uh, Secretary of State was the uh, Libya intervention of, of 2011. I don't pretend to know uh, uh, the, how the decisions were made that led to that uh, decision to, uh, to bring about regime change uh, in Libya, but at least when you go by the press reports, uh, it appears that uh, she was one of the principal promoters of that uh, escapade, famously uh, saying in public uh, when uh, Gaddafi was uh, murdered, uh, you know, we came, we saw, he died, uh, with a sort of uh, smugness uh, that I find repugnant, uh, but, but more to the point, the consequences of that intervention turned out to be uh, quite negative. Indeed, creating a space for a new uh, ISIS franchise uh, to take root uh, in, in Libya. Uh, so, and, and although she has expressed regret for certain uh, actions on her part, for example, voting in favor of the Iraq war. Uh, to my knowledge, she has not expressed any regret uh, about overthrowing Gaddafi or even any real awareness about the negative consequences of that action. So, so I'm with you. I'm for creativity. Um, don't hold your breath. Some, all the way in the back, the gentleman with the tie clip on, I think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Flown, and I'm with the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. I wanted to ask... And I'm going to ask you just to speak up a little bit, because I can barely hear you. Definitely. Um, I wanted to ask how you evaluate arguments made by some that the next president's uh, foreign policy should be centered around uh, the use of USAID and uh, solving problems before they end up militarizing. Uh, you know, I, I'm for creativity. 
I'm for solving problems before they arise. Uh, I don't know a hell of a lot about development, uh, but the little bit I know persuades me that uh, it, in theory it's great, in practice it's difficult. I mean, when, when uh, I, uh, along with so many of our fellow citizens, uh, discovered Afghanistan uh, after 2001, I mean, one of the things that I didn't know about was back in the 1950s, uh, we had a, we, the United States government, had a very substantial uh, program of uh, economic assistance and development in Afghanistan uh, that, to my understanding, sort of a briefly showed some signs of success, but that has long since uh, vanished. Since 9-11, uh, I saw a figure the other day about how much we spent in Afghanistan trying to create a, a functional nation state with a, with a decent economy. It, it's upwards of a trillion now, isn't it? Something like that. Not nearly as much as we've wasted on fighting the wars, but, but something like a trillion dollars. Uh, far as I can tell, uh, it's been money down a rat hole. Sad to say. Uh, so, so solving problems before they uh, emerge through economic development programs is something I would happily sign up for if I saw any evidence that that approach worked. Uh, and as far as I can tell, the evidence is hard to come by. You know, it's, there's something magical about when nations take off. Uh, when I was a young person, it was, a, it was taken for granted that places like South Korea would forever be backward countries uh, with no significant economic development. Ditto for Taiwan. Certainly, ditto for China. Uh, over the past 30, 40 years, we have seen the extent to which uh, development can happen at, at a spectacular uh, rate. Uh, but it's not clear to me that the United States plays much of a role in making that happen. Uh, it has to do with conditions internal to the country, uh, to uh, commitments made by governments to, to, to mobilize uh, entrepreneurship, uh, and, 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 and then you see it. So I'm, not, I'm just not persuaded that we have much of a capacity to reach in, into a country and make that happen. Yes, ma'am. Hi. You mentioned early on in your talk that past presidents, specifically Kennedy and Reagan, were able to use the discourse of peace right. um, to rally the American public. And I was wondering if there are obstacles today to using that same discourse. It seems that people who talk about peace are viewed or disparaged as being weak on security. Could you address that? Well, I think that's true. Uh, you know, there. Th well, it, it, it's true. Uh, you know, Hillary, Hillary Clinton would not have won the nomination, would not have won the presidency, if she portrayed herself as something other than the hawk that she uh, is. Uh, that's what you need to do, I think, to to get elected in this country to any kind of a substantial office. So, you know, it would be great if we had a peace party or even if we just had one party that was skeptical of, of uh, armed intervention, uh, but we don't. We have two war parties, Republicans and Democrats, pretend to differ on these matters, but they, but they don't. Uh, there's no significant, I give, I give talks to uh, so-called peace and justice groups uh, with some frequency, uh, and uh, they're always, the audience, wonderful people, and they all look like me. I mean, it's almost 100% over 60, if not over 70, 90% white. Uh, it, the peace and justice movers, movement sure the heck doesn't look like America. Uh, and that's a very sad fact. Uh, it's very sad that, uh, that, that we, the people, uh, accept the, the, the elimination of peace as an ultimate goal of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but it's a fact. It happened. And it's a deeply regrettable one. Yes, sir. Hi, Bonnie from the Daily Ripple. Um, two things. One, um, when we talked about
about the Clintons, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Clinton, uh, President Clinton, uh, had the least amount of our soldiers killed prior to maybe Roosevelt uh, in actual combat action. Uh, he had 76 people killed total, 75 people killed, one in combat, 74 in, in uh, terrorist attacks, which I believe would be uh, correct. Um, and the, but the question is, is the Arab Spring happened in, and in February of 2011, the Brits and the French were begging us to be part of Libya. Um, and at the end of March, after Gaddafi left, they, it was a year later, they, they voted for their first government. So would you say it was better to have uh, a dictator or someone, I mean, if they can't handle their own government, yeah, I get that, but they did vote for their own government. Hey, if, if maybe I'm missing the papers. It, it, are, you, are you suggesting that Libya is a stable democracy today? No, oh, no, okay. It's better to have, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, it'd be great, along with creativity and, and solving problems before they emerge, if we could have the world be, consist of li liberal democratic states. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, given that, if the choice is anarchy versus stability, I'll take stability. Regime, regime, regime change in Libya produced anarchy. No, that's, there's been a civil war in Libya for the last couple of years. I'm, 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 you and I are talking past each other, I think. I'm not quite sure I understand your point. Yes, they did. Okay. Oh, oh, I see. So, the, so the, your argument is that we overthrow the dictator, there is an election, and now it's their problem. In other words, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need to examine the aftermath of our intervention beyond the date of the election and have, see that, that we're somehow responsible for the consequences of overthrowing. Our, our responsibility ends when they elect their government in your view. That's not a view I would agree with. I see. I see. Okay. Okay, I got it. Right. Uh, yes, ma'am. In the along the aisle there. Hi, Ava Havis. Um, following up on that question about peace, given the current political situation, and given the fact I agree with you as somebody who's in the peace groups that they don't look like America and they're they're older than they should be. Um, do you see anything that could reverse that trend? Well, I, I mean, my argument has been uh, in, in more than one book uh, that there will be no substantial change in our approach to U foreign and national security policy until we, the people, uh, demand it. Uh, and and that's, why, that, that's where the, uh, the Obama light footprint really, and it's not that this is part of some conspiracy, but it has such uh, nefarious uh, implications. Uh, be, because we, we now are a country where war has become a normal condition and we the people accept that more or less unquestioningly. And as long as that continues to be the case, given uh, the constellation of power in Washington, given the fact that both of the main political parties are uh, committed to a militarized uh, foreign policy, uh, change isn't going to happen unless uh, American people get fed up. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that uh, the American people retain a capacity to get fed up and to demonstrate their anger on matters like, you know, Black Lives Matter or the, the Occupy movement. People, people can get uppity, uh, but we're not uppity uh, when it comes to our uh, militarized and uh, costly and un unsuccessful approach to national security policy. Yes, sir. I'm 
Bert Wides. I'm a pro bono advocate on, on these issues. Um, I want to go back to your, and uh, by the way, I agree with almost everything you said. I thought it was brilliantly articulate. But with regard to the fundamental issue of intervention, uh, in this town, when things like Syria and all the devastation come up, um, the left and to some extent the right uh, view every time we intervene is making it worse if doing anything. Uh, but there is a, a central group that follows the, the concept of responsibility to protect, that at some point the humanitarian situation is so bad we should go in. And given your overall approach, I'm wondering if still on a case-by-case -case basis uh, you gave any consideration to what uh, the Secretary of Defense, CIA, and uh, State were recommending early in the Syrian situation of not combat troops, but using tomahawks, drones to at least crater the airfields and so forth. How long does it take to repair an airfield? Uh, Hour and a half? And to destroy uh, Syria's Air Force capability for the kind of barrel then, then, bombing and then so what? forth. Then, then what, what's the next step? Uh, then we just say, okay, we, we're done now. I mean, one, one has yeah. to think through. You know, what's, what, is, what, what, what is the next step? And, and, you know, what, I, I, have strong, I have strong views on this matter, and my strong views say that when I look at the, 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 the pattern and the consequences of U.S. military intervention in the Islamic world, everywhere from Libya to Afghanistan, with very, very few exceptions, we've made matters worse. And therefore, when we confront humanitarian disasters, like the one that has been unfolding in Syria, and we ask ourselves, well, does the United States have some kind of a moral obligation to do something? I say, yes. But let's do something that is actually effective, not something that sort of makes us feel good. Look, we cratered the airfields. And, and frankly, it's not that, di I mean, it's not that difficult to figure out what we could do that would be effective in providing assistance to the people who are being dispossessed. What, what would that be? Bring them here, the Angela Merkel solution. Germany, think about this, folks. Germany is saving a million lives by admitting a million refugees to Germany. We have, if I'm not mistaken, admitted 10,000. President says he'd like to make that be, what, another 65,000 uh, next year or something like that? You know, he can say that. He's not going to be president. Uh, but 10,000 versus a million. That's an effective response that is within our capability to do if we actually chose to do that. But the fact of the matter is, and you know it and I know it, our fellow citizens don't want a million Syrians coming into our country. And therefore, when we get, you know, we feel all this angst about the need to do something, then cratering airfields or dropping bombs or sending in special operations forces or doing drone strikes is a way for us to persuade ourselves that we're actually doing something meaningful even when we're not. Yes, sir. And I think this is going to be the, the last question because we're almost out uh, of time. That puts a lot of pressure. Uh, thank you very much for a very, very thoughtful uh, talk. I, I, I'd like to ask perhaps a more, more personal question. More cur I'm curious. S uh, Congressman Seth Moulton presented what I thought was a, also a thoughtful you know, kind of proposal in terms of Iraq policy for, for, for the US. And since you're in Boston, I wonder if, do you know him? Do you talk to him? Did you have anything to do with? Uh, he's not with my Hopkins? congressman. He, I live I, south of Boston. He's know, the he's the member from the North Shore. Yes, I know him. I know him. And, and do you sort of advise him? Do you talk? I mean, did you have a? 
a hand. It's not like a, it's, it's, it's some sneaky. Some, there's a, a, no, no, I don't a, mean a sneaky. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm actually, man I'm, 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 I might, I might actually see him tonight. I'm giving a talk back in Boston, and uh, I got a call from one of his uh, staffers, and I, I think there's a good chance he's going to come to my talk. So I see him from time to time. He's, he's I, th I think, uh, a, he's a terrific guy. Uh, B, uh, I, I think he's got an incredible future uh, in front of him. Uh, if he plays his cards right, and because he's real smart, I think he's going to play his, his, his cards. He's not going to spend the rest of his life as a member of the House of Representatives. Uh, so he's uh, really somebody to watch. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Seth Moulton's uh, he's got to be about 35, something like that. Uh, Harvard graduate, uh, Marine Corps veteran, uh, tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, eloquent, thoughtful, uh, very much a critic of uh, the misuse of American military power, very much a critic of our current military system, that is to say, our reliance on uh, this so-called all-volunteer force, which he believes, and I believe, is one of the factors contributing to uh, the public's willingness to tune out uh, wars because they're not, not engaged. So uh, he, he is one of those. Uh, who, who believes that we ought to have some form of national service uh, in this country. That is to say that all young people will uh, spend a term of, of, of service to, to country or community in some capacity, maybe in military service, maybe not, but as a way to enrich uh, uh, the definition of, of citizenship uh, and as a way to uh, reconnect uh, the American people to, to the military. I'm glad to see the connection between the two of you. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it.